Hi. Um, any questions on the material? Yes. Um, so last class, you said that in the shock of, that, of having the sign wears off, that you're going to see the less effect of like having the sign on people getting scared. But when you're when you're making like a uh, like a public policy recommendation, say if you put the signs in every you know, place for a year, you're going to have this much effect. How do you take that into account? Yeah, so whenever you're designing, so the question had to do with this thing known as extinction when you do educational interventions. So almost any intervention, I imagine, but certainly interventions that involve teaching people things, the knowledge lapses. I mean, think about those of you that are now a year or two after organic chemistry or a year or two after your Russian novel course. You know, your, your peak knowledge for that class was when you took the final exam, and then your ignorance increases rapidly after that. Uh, so, you know, you can't remember the Grignard reaction anymore, and you barely remember the derivation of Avogadro's number. I mean, you forgot. So, same with educational or policy interventions. They extinguish uh, any kind of treatments like that, extinguish. And, um, and so, typically, what's required is kind of constant novelty or refreshment. So you have to keep, for example, what they will do in the sign type of intervention is they'll rotate the signs. So it's a different kind of sign that gets your, atten gets your attention each time. So, um, so that's why, for example, you'll see that oftentimes in, uh, in, uh, in those, have you noticed those signs on highways that say your speed and give you your speed? They, the police will move those around so they're not always in the same location. Because you just get used to seeing the your speed sign in this location, you stop paying attention to it. But if they move it, you know, 100 yards somewhere else, you will notice it again. Did I so, therefore, when you implement the policy and you estimate its effect size, you need to account for the likelihood of extinction and then work out, given the likelihood that the effect will decline over time and whatever modifications you could make to maximize it, what actually happens in a policy way. And then you would model out that effect. Other questions? Okay, so last time we discussed the status of the uninsured in the United States. I mean, as you guys probably saw from my remarks on insurance I, and the whole class, you know, I'm not, I'm not of the opinion that this is such a um, crucial to the health of the nation. Nevertheless, it would be irresponsible to get through a whole class and not give you some sense of this most active, most important uh, public policy issue with respect to health and healthcare in the United States, which is the implementation of the ACA. And then we moved on to a potpourri of other sorts of policy interventions, including nudges uh, and a quick review of a variety of ideas about how you might, in a tight way, intervene to affect health and healthcare uh, in different sorts of ways. Today I'm going to be just trying to give you a different sense of how I see the topic that we've been discussing, how I, how I integrate all of the kinds of things we've been exploring. and to some extent, like how I myself have come to the kinds of opinions and views that I've been sharing with you over the course of the semester. So I wanted to start by asking, what have we learned? And most generally, we've seen that health and illness depend critically on non-biological and non-medical factors. We've seen that from 1900 to 2000, life expectancy at birth increased from 48 years to 80 years for women and from 46 years to 74 years in men. And this has been especially because of reductions in mortality at an early age, but also due to some improvements at older ages, in midlife and in old age. And it's worth noting, however, that this decline in early life mortality is a one-of-a-kind thing. It's a singular thing that our species has done and that we only get to do one time in our evolution, which is to conquer childhood illnesses. We don't get to do that a second time. We don't get to conquer childhood illnesses again and gain another 20 years in life expectancy. We already did that. And improvements since then are smaller uh, and smaller. It's an unrepeatable advance. And as I said, we don't get to conquer childhood disease a second time. And the maximum human life expectancy actually hasn't changed very much over the last 100 years. The upper limit in how long people have lived, as far as we can tell, hasn't changed in a 1,000 years. People live to 100, 120, that's the maximum. And we saw, over the course of the semester, we saw that much of the decline in mortality preceded, often by several decades, the discovery of specific medical treatments, strongly suggesting the role of social changes uh, in, as compared with specific medical discoveries uh, or advances. 
And we also saw that in parallel to improvements in, end of, uh, in longevity, there's been a significant decline in disability in our society over the last few decades. For example, 2% per year decline over the last two years, addressing the issue of the compression of morbidity that we discussed at the beginning, so that we're living longer and we're sick for less long at the same time. And this too was partly due to social changes and partly due to medical advances. We've seen that these improvements have been une unevenly distributed in our society, stratified by socioeconomic status, and that this unevenness is one of the many clues, not only regarding the fundamentally social nature of the topics that we've been discussing, but also regarding the fundamentally moral nature of the topics that we've been discussing. So, and, and, and this uneven distribution by SES, which highlights the moral dimension of the whole, the, everything we've been considering this semester, uh, is, is itself important. But it's not even necessary when you think about it, what it is that we've been discussing. Because it is the case, in fact, that life, death, and suffering are in and of themselves a tremendous marker for the moral weight of the topics that we've been reviewing. We've discussed how a society may contain different starting positions into which people are born, many different destinies that people are fated to have. How are we to know what is just? The workings of the natural lottery and of the social lottery, that is the working of forces outside of an individual's control in determining in an individual's health cannot possibly be justified by an appeal to merit or desert. Those lotteries assign you these fates through no fault of your own. They cannot be justified on utilitarian grounds either. How are we to justify the birth with a disability or the birth into a poor family that limits a person's prospects? As philosopher John Rawls has argued, it is to these inequalities, presumably inevitable in the basic structure of any society, to which the principles of social justice must in the first instance apply. Rawls argues that justice arises when all social values, liberty and opportunity, income and wealth, and the bases of self-respect are distributed equally unless an unequal distribution of any or all of these values is somehow to everyone's advantage. And liberty and justice are indeed social phenomena. We do not generally speak of your freedom from nature. We speak of your freedom from other people. And we don't usually speak of the workings of nature as being unjust. We speak of how you might be treated unjustly by other humans. And accordingly, to the extent that health is a social phenomenon and a social value as well, and to the extent that it transcends our biology, the occurrence and distribution of health raises questions of social justice. My argument is so far that you can't talk about this topic. You can't talk about health and survival and morality and, and, and mortality without engaging issues not only of public policy, but also of morality. These are intrinsically moral things, ethical things, that we've been considering for most of the semester. And with respect to the factors beyond individual control, with respect to what these factors beyond individual control foreordain, we've seen that the exposure to poverty or malnutrition, even prior to one's birth, can affect one's risk of developing illnesses many years later in life. We've seen that whether one even survives a neonatal period depends on the race of one's parents, or their education, or a host of other factors over which you have no control, such as your birth order. We've seen that how genes affect you can depend on your environment, and that genes may be regulated by social exposures. We've even seen that the culture of our ancestors thousands of years ago has reshaped the bodies that we occupy today in ways clearly far surpassing any kind of individual agency we might evince. We've seen that social circumstances, such as one's schooling or one's wealth, are not only affected by, but more considerably affect one's health. And we've looked at many health-related behaviors and seen how they are a product not only of individual choice, not only of individual agency, but also of one's social circumstances and of social influence and social structure. We've seen how obesity and smoking, for example, are socially patterned by race and income and how they are strongly influenced by factors outside the individual. We've looked at more complicated social circumstances as well, 
Our health depends on who you know, where you live, and what the people around you are doing. So we saw that income inequality, measured at the state level or at other geographic levels, was associated with outcomes like maternal depression or longevity. And we saw that measures of social capital, also measured at the state or some other aggregate or larger uh, level, or at a smaller level, were associated with mortality at the individual level. And that social capital reflects our collective ability to maintain both individual and collective health. Local norms and culture are also important, and neighborhoods also matter, affecting whether one becomes depressed, falls ill with heart disease, or dies, even after accounting for individual level attributes of your own, or individual level measures of your biology or clinical circumstances. Other environmental factors, such as pollution, exposure to secondhand tobacco smoke, traffic patterns, and crime, all of which we've seen some information about, also are highly relevant. And in terms of who you know, we saw evidence that one's health behaviors, whether related to smoking, or weight, or drug use, or exercise, or drinking, are all strongly influenced by the behavior of those around you, even people beyond your social horizon that you don't even know, at two or three degrees removed. More generally, we saw that one's health depends on the extent of one's social support and on the nature of one's social network. Isolated individuals fare worse. And the more socially integrated one is, the better for one's health. Now, one's, <laughs> one's health also depends on medical care, of course. It's necessary to acknowledge. But medical care is not uniformly good or uniformly available. And we saw evidence for both the benefits and the harms that can arise from medicine, and for the potentially capricious play of physician decision making in one's health. Moreover, we saw that despite our terrific and expensive healthcare system, 40 to 70% of Americans die in pain. We can't even achieve the objective, despite all our science, despite all our wealth, of guaranteeing our citizens a peaceful and civilized death, let alone, one might ask, the kind of healthcare they get prior to that. And surely, in my judgment, this is a very substantial failing of our society. In short, not only do all these social factors influence whether you fall ill, not only do they influence the course of your disease and recovery, but they also influence how doctors treat you and even how you die. Seeing all these things another way, from 1900 to the present, only about five of the 30 years of increased life expectancy can plausibly be attributed to medical care and medical advances. Another estimate is that since 1950, a later starting point, Medical discoveries and implementations account for no more than three of the extra seven years in life expectancy we've acquired since then. <clears throat> now, three years is a big deal, especially at the population level, but healthcare, once again, is not the main driver of the health of the public. And in summary, the causes of wellness in Americans can be partitioned as follows, as taken from your reading. So there's genetic and gestational endowments, which account for 30%, social circumstances, which account for 15%, environmental conditions for 5%, behaviors for 40%, and medical care for 10%. And reviewing that list from the top again, less than 2% of deaths are due to purely genetic diseases. And while as much as 60% of chronic disease, such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer, may have a genetic component, most of the time, other factors co-conspire, other social and environmental factors, co-conspire with genetic and gestational risks to make the individual ill. Less than half of the time are genes solely explanatory, as borne out by studies of twins. And many gestational factors are themselves related to the social and environmental circumstances considered further down on the list. So for example, if your mother is poor or starving, and you have a low birth weight, which is a gestational factor, that had a prior antecedent social determinant that contributed to that gestational determinant. Next on the list is social circumstances as diverse as education and income, housing, crime, social capital, religion, and occupation. They too are highly relevant to the uh, uh, to, in, to health and health uh, to the health and mortality, accounting for 15% of the variation in whether you uh, fall ill or die. Indeed, poverty alone probably is responsible for 6% of all mortality in the United States. Poverty is a leading killer uh, in our society. 
Environmental ha factors include as diverse things like toxic agents, structural hazards, chemical contaminants of food and water, pollution, street and urban design, and so on, and they account for about 5%. Motor vehicle accidents will fall under this category, and environmental factors could, of course, predispose you to infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, so if you look at the density of our cities, for example. Behaviors related to exercise, sex, seatbelt uh, use, substance use, safety precautions, not only like seatbelts, but also like bicycle helmets, and smoking are by far the most important determinants of health, as we have seen. And they involve both individual agency and structural constraints. And finally, medical care is important too, but it accounts for only a fraction of the preventable deaths in our society. That is, only 10% or so of the deaths in our country could be avoided by the greater availability or availability of better medical care or both. Medicine is not the source of health in our society. Now, all of the foregoing actually can get mapped onto our biology, of course. And we come to embody all of these factors. After a life of smoking and poverty, how can their effects on our body possibly be seen as irrelevant or as ignorable? And these factors get under our skin, literally. A key topic of research in medicine and biology in the future will be to actually figure out how this happens. And you were introduced to some ideas on this topic as well, how we biologize these types of social exposures, how they reshape our physiology and even our genes. So we might ask questions like, how might poverty or child abuse or malnourishment regulate our genes quasi-permanently, for example? And thus we saw evidence for a kind of social epigenetics, whereby our genome comes to be regulated by social factors over the course of our own lifetimes. And we even saw evidence that our genome is affected by culture over very long time horizons, as, as in the case of domesticating animals, inventing cities, and changing marital rules which may themselves have created selection pressures and shaped the kind of bodies that we inhabit and live in the world with today. Now, it's possible that the contribution of medical care to life expectancy, and more likely the compression of morbidity, will continue to grow as technology is better able to address healthcare needs. But I doubt it. The kind of evolution towards a cyborg existence we also discussed might happen, but I don't think we should count on it in the short term time frame, uh, and, and uh, let alone at all. <clears throat> Indeed, I think that further improvements in the quality and use of medical care have a relatively limited ability to reduce deaths in the United States. And this is not too surprising if you think about it, because we already spend 16%, more than 16% of our GDP on health care. How much more could we spend? How much better could we do? If your vision is that we can just spend more money, get better, more health care, that that would work, actually, we already spend more than anyone else. As we saw at the beginning of the course, we spend four times more than England per capita, and yet have worse health statistics than they do. So the source of the solution is not in more medical care, is not in more spending, in my opinion. In addition, I think that ultimately, the health fate of each of us is determined by factors acting not in isolation, but by our experience where domains interconnect. For example, whether a gene is expressed can be determined by environmental exposures or behavioral, behavioral patterns. And of course, the nature and consequences of behavioral choices are affected by our social circumstances. So as we've also seen, these determinants are very complex. They're interconnected in subtle and difficult to discern ways. And they co-conspire to have us in their grip to determine such a thing so important as our health and survival, and yet in a way that isn't so trivially transparent. Oh, it's just this factor causing this outcome. So at the population level, social conditions and behaviors are much more powerful determinants of health than access to care, by which I mean not only having insurance but the, or the means to pay for medical care, but also even the opportunity to use it. These are the things that really determine the health of the public. Limited access to medical services, while problematic, unjust, and reprehensible, is not the primary basis for ill health or for the socioeconomic disparities in health that we see. And we know this, as you've seen, for several reasons. First of all, 
social factors are more important in explaining health outcomes than clinical factors. Second, there are widening differentials in health status, according to SES, even in Britain, where there is universal access, or in the United States, after the introduction of Medicare for the elderly, as we saw earlier in the course. And again, from this line of reasoning, socioeconomic factors are more important than access or use of medical care. Third, the effect of SES on health status persists even after adjusting for access to medical care. SES is a fundamental cause of health and an independent cause uh, from medical care. And finally, even in the setting of a clinical drug trial being conducted by some of the doctors, best doctors in the country at elite teaching hospitals, you bring patients in, you put them in a drug trial, as we saw with the diabetes paper from a few weeks ago, and you give them medical care that's just phenomenal, like the best we have to offer. Even in that setting, SES explains a substantial fraction of the variance in health outcomes experienced by those patients. Even when you're giving the best health care possible, SES still matters. So for all these reasons, we know that medical care does not explain the SES disparities in health. So in short, while biomedical care might be effective in acute and inpatient conditions, in chronic disease and in outpatient settings, it is less effective. Thus, a focus on access to healthcare professionals ignores the most important determinant of health, the patient, him or herself, and his or her sociocultural context. Now, other things are changing in medical care, too, that further encourage the foregoing neglect of the real roots of illness. So why, if this is the case, if you see what we've read for the semester and, and believe it, if it's the case, why, why is it so difficult to come to grips with that reality? Well, other things are changing in medical care, and, that, and this also sort of encourages us to forego some of these realizations. Progressively, over the latter part of the 20th century, physicians have become increasingly bureaucratized. Physicians have increasingly become functionaries and technicians increasingly divorced, I think, from the moral and social aspects of their work. And in addition, there have been changes in medical epistemology, that's how we come to know things, the science of, of understanding, in how medical knowledge was created and organized. So the, the kind of underlying ways in which doctors come to know the world have been changing over the last 100 years. And that change also is contributing to the effacement of the moral, to the effacement of the social from healthcare. For instance, over the course of the last century, physicians began to believe that two different patients might have, in a very fundamental sense, the same disease. Medicine progressively moved from an individualistic notion of disease to one concerned with the centrality of diagnostic categories based on specific causative agents. The whole philosophy that you take for granted about how to see patients is a modern invention. The philosophy that says, Actually, the diagnosis is what matters, not the patient. That patients are endlessly reproducible biological facts is itself a posture, an, an epistemological stance. If you look around and you say, oh, this patient has diabetes, and that patient has diabetes, and that patient has diabetes, and you lose sight of the patient. And this development of clinical thought was associated with substantial increase in attention to making diagnoses of conditions that were believed to have identities independent of their existence in the given patient and parallelly with a relative decrease in attention to patient-specific factors like their social circumstances. This change, plus the discovery of manifestly effective treatments for disease, like antibiotics in the 1930s and 40s, worked to shift clinical attention away from the individual patient and towards the diagnostic category and the corresponding therapy. As if the challenge was to ignore the patient, identify the diagnosis, and then ipso facto prescribe the treatment. Attention, therefore, is directed to what is deemed to be the essence of the patient's problem. And this leads to a clinical gaze that is through the patient rather than upon the patient. The patient becomes not so much a sick person as an endlessly reproducible pathological fact, to borrow a phrase from Michel Foucault. Now, both of these changes, the bureaucratization of, medicine, of medical practice, which makes doctors into automatons in the way that Ivan Illich was describing, and the shift away from seeing patients as distinctive, the latter partly required by a more scientific approach, 
right? So this is, I'm not saying it's bad to be scientific, I'm just saying there's a downside to be scientific. The combination of these changes have helped to shift our focus towards, uh, 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 has sh helped to shift our focus towards aspects of patient experience that deliberately isolate patients from their surroundings. The whole way modern medicine is organized is atomistic, right? It actually is deliberately designed to take the patient out of, uh, out of their circumstances and just see them as endlessly reproducible pathological facts. So a focus on healthcare rather than on the real determinants of health and illness, when coupled with these changes in the practice of medicine and the role of physicians, can lead and had led us, in my judgment, to several decades of misguided public health policy. In my judgment, to truly improve health of the population, physicians must serve as advocates for improved social conditions, for public health initiatives, both general and health education, and for behavioral uh, interventions. And the reason, for me, is obvious. Illness is a social and not just a biological phenomenon. And as such, it has social origins and may thus have social cures. Now, to be clear, identifying the roots of a problematic social phenomenon invites consideration of how you might solve it. And while it is also true that that which explains something may not necessarily be that which solves it, it seems clear that we need to pay more attention to issues of public health. When a social factor is seen to increase the risk of disease onset, or the risk of a bad outcome given onset, then the opposite factor is typically seen to have the opposite beneficial effects. Current developments in the social sciences may actually help shed light in some of these topics of the determinants of health and the impact of healthcare. And we are, I think, in the midst of major changes uh, in this regard. Now, for the past century, human beings have looked to the sort of physical and biological sciences to solve important problems and to advance human welfare. And they have reaped great rewards from discoveries as diverse as computers and plastics and antibiotics and all the other kind of technological things that we have as part of our lives. But I actually think that in the 21st century, the social sciences offer equal promise for improving human welfare. Human lives can be substantially improved through a deeper understanding of behavior and its fundamental biological and social origins. Now, traditional research in the social sciences has generally favored observational rather than experimental methods. And it has generally involved special subsamples of people rather than entire populations. And finally, it has generally tended to neglect the role of biology. But I think this is changing in three radical ways, all of which we have also seen this semester. Ways in which the social sciences are in very active ferment and are modifying themselves and being modified by exogenous forces in a way that can enhance our response to the exact problems that we've been considering in this class. First of all, I think that a biological hurricane is approaching the social sciences. I think that new findings in biology, in genetics and neuroscience, for instance, are forcing a rethinking of human behavior and of human interactions. And analogously, progress in the social sciences is begging new questions in biology. For example, the social sciences have long been interested in the problem of cooperation. And now you find this sort of percolating throughout biology. We begin to think about bacteria cooperating with each other, or animals cooperating with each other, or cells cooperating with each other, borrowing ideas from the social sciences that have been under active development for several decades. The progress of this progress, in this kind of merging of the biological and the social sciences, affords an opportunity to build a new synthesis of biology and social science. One that avoids uh, the extremes of biological, uh, the extremes of strict biological determinism on the one hand and strict cultural constructivism on the other. Such a synthesis would transcend the false distinction or the false division between nature and nurture. And it would, it would allow us to understand the causes of human behavior in a much more complete and powerful way. Actually, believe it or not, this point is also an illustration of the way in which you guys come to learn things <laughs> which you take for granted in the way that Emily Martin argued. So the whole reason the social sciences are seen as separate from the natural sciences actually pertains to a medieval theology where human beings were seen as not a part of the natural world. God was seen as having made humans separate from every other parts of nature. And therefore, the laws of nature ostensibly didn't apply to people. 
So the departmental structure that you guys take for granted at Yale, the division of knowledge that you guys take for granted, actually owes its origins to medieval theology. Why should we stick with that? Why should we not see humans merge the social and biological sciences and see humans as equally social and biological at the same time? So the first thing that's happening in the social sciences that's relevant to the task before us that we've been seeing in the class is this biological hurricane. The second thing that's happening, which you guys, your generation, is very much a part of, is the recognition that we live in a world of pervasive data. And this has led to the advent of a new kind of computational social science. If you had asked social scientists even 20 years ago what powers they dreamed of having, they would have said they would have wished they could have a little tiny Black Hawk helicopter, a microscopic one, that could fly on top of you and see where you are and who you're talking to and what you're buying and what you're thinking. And if it could do that for a whole city of people in real time, it would be unbelievable. Now that's of course exactly what we have with the sort of cell phones that we have in our pockets. We have the capacity now to unobtrusively follow very large populations of people and collect data about their behavior and to begin to tackle significant questions about the determinants of how populations behave. Third, the third thing you've seen in terms of how the social sciences are changing and how this can uh, allow us to confront these uh, topics of public health better is that the social sciences are rushing to embrace experiments now in both the lab and in the field. The great majority of research in the traditional social sciences, leaving aside psychology, which always had a tradition, experimental tradition, has involved observational data and not the controlled experiments that are so common in the natural sciences. Now, what's weird about this is that if you go back 80 years, sociologists were doing randomized controlled trials of educational interventions. Anthropologists were doing randomized trials, experiments. Economists were doing them. But what actually happened, roughly speaking, is that in the 1950s, survey methodology and, and regression models were invented. And the fields became besotted with the idea of using observational data and mathematical models to model behavior. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's terrific. More than half of the work you read is in that category. But it then sort of forgot, in a kind of Lord of the Rings, you know, previous age way, forgot, uh, you know, myth turned into legend, and legend turned into whatever, or history turned into myth, and myth to legend. Anyway, like that. Uh, forgot, actually, the traditions that were part of the disciplines. But they're being rediscovered now. People are beginning to rediscover the use of experimentation across the social sciences. And there's a boom in field experiments. And this approach is rapidly reshaping the way that social scientists translate their knowledge into practice. And you saw many examples of this as well over the course of the semester. Social science experiments that were done to try to identify different sorts of effects of policies and of exposures that people might have. Such new approaches and new findings are certain, in my judgment, to reshape our understanding of public policy and public health in many valuable ways. But regardless of the style of research, well, almost regardless, almost regardless of the style of research, however, here is why this type of shift in perceptions about the real determinants of health that we've been considering all semester is important. Approximately 95% of the trillion dollars the United States spends on health each year goes to direct medical care services, and just 5% is allocated to population-wide approaches to illness prevention and health improvement. So the argument now is that a change in perception could lead to a change in policies and in spending, which in turn could lead to a change in health. Shifting how we see these things has consequences. And in fact, I want those consequences because I believe those consequences actually will shift the health of the public. As we have seen, this allocation, I would say misallocation, partly reflects an underinvestment in public goods. Decisions made at the individual level, even if rational, may lead to irrational outcomes at the collective level, as we saw with classical examples such as the mattress on Route 28, the prisoner's dilemma, or the dollar auction which all of you willy-nilly fell prey to, behaving uh, each of you individually rationally, leading to an irrational outcome at the collective level. And that reinforces the idea that decisions reached individually, however seemingly rational or irrational, are not necessarily the best for society. The example of the tragedy of the commons is fitting in this regard. Every herdsman, quite rationally, seeks to maximize his gain and enlarge his herd, grazing on the commons. 
but in so doing, he contributes to an overgrazing of the commons to the detriment of all. Each person acting in their own interest and pursuing what is in fact the only sensible course of action from an individual perspective drives the move to ruin. And that's sort of what's been happening with health and healthcare in our society. So why aren't we doing something more better about it? What are some of the barriers to implementing public health interventions beyond their public goods nature? So there are a number of such barriers that are preventing us from acting on some of the things that you've learned during the course. The first is the complex cost-effectiveness assessments. It's difficult to judge what is worth spending the money on in this domain. So we say, OK, we have a billion dollars. How do we spend it? Where do we get the most bang for the buck? It's not trivial to do those kinds of assessments to have rational policy. In addition, the interventions are often complex and are directed at multiple causes. It's not like I can say, if headache, then aspirin. Simple rule, simple algorithm, cheap drug, just do it. Actually, we have if poverty, then what? What do we do with poverty to improve health, for example? Interest group dynamics and vague proponents are another problem. So we've got conflicting, you know, in a democratic polity, we've got conflicting constituencies that want different things. And it's not always clear who benefits from something. One of the examples we talked about was the problem of bad care of the terminally ill. Part of the reason the care for the terminally ill is so bad is that the terminally ill people cannot band together and march in the streets with placards demanding better terminal care. You know, what do we want? Good death. When do we want it? Now. You know, <laughs> you don't get that kind of political will because the people are dying. They're leaving this earth. And so that's one of the reasons, just like we neglect the needs of children who don't vote, we neglect the needs of the seriously and terminally ill because they also don't vote. Another factor, uh, another factor that contributes is the broad coordination of actors outside of health policy that is required. So for example, many of the kinds of things we've been discussing, it's not like it just requires doctors or public health experts to do something about it. You need all kinds of other people in other sectors of the economy to work together to achieve the particular objectives that we have in mind. And finally, we have to acknowledge that there are very profound social preferences about unhealthy behaviors. People like to smoke and drink and have you know, risky sex and all kinds of things like that, which put them at risk. So actually, people, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with something that is kind of fun for many people, and it's you know, not so easy to change. So we need to do more, and we should do more, but it's not uh, easy. And you have to ask the question, how high a percentage above the 5% that we're spending on prevention should we spend? And truly, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that sometimes prevention will save money, and sometimes it will not. And this is another subtle argument that's often lost. Oftentimes, when you're discussing prevention interventions with policymakers, they say, well, OK, I'm willing to spend a dollar on prevention if it'll save me $2 on therapy. But we don't have that conversation when we're talking about new therapeutic in interventions. We don't say, I'm willing to spend $2 on therapy if this therapy costs less than the $4 therapy. The point I'm making is that sometimes we should be willing to pay for prevention even if it's expensive. It can be worth it even without the justification that actually it's going to save curative dollars later on. Because I think it's worth valuing population health, and we should spend money on it regardless. Many prevention initiatives, in fact, as I've mentioned, depend upon policy changes that are outside the traditional policy world or outside the conventional medical perspective. And these include other sorts of things that we've seen, like excise taxes on tobacco and alcohol products, or passage and enforcement of non-smoking laws and ordinances, or the development and implementation of safety standards for workers and products or zoning approaches to enhance recreational opportunities, or reduce the density of bars and environmental temptations in an environment, or the establishment and monitoring of environmental standards for potential hazards, or the adoption of community water supply standards, for example, fluoridation, or cleaning the water supply in ways that advance the public health. This is, all of these things require people outside doctors, not just doctors, to achieve. Or the assurance of truth and reliability in the marketing of health-related products, or finally, in the deliberate investment in social capital. All of those things are not just problems for physicians or healthcare workers. And these are all examples of important prevention efforts that not only touch on, but are also often entirely dependent upon actions across a broad range of the political and policy arena. Now, 
Despite the fact, or despite the fact that there's been so much stability in our society with, res with respect to traditions and culture, this is, despite the fact that society has a certain amount of inertia, social change, while difficult, is possible as well. And even the briefest of, of, of glances across the last 100 years, or the last 50 years, or even the last 20 years, can confirm that there are many radical changes that, can have, hap that have happened and can happen in our society. We can look at SES attributes of and the cultural attitudes towards health-relevant phenomena in our, in our society have undergone radical changes. Everyday things in your own lives have changed, whether you're aware of it or not. Smoking has declined very significantly in the last 20 years. Condom use has increased very significantly. Seatbelt use and helmet use have, have increased dramatically. Most of you probably took it for granted that it was normal to wear helmets. I remember when you rode your bicycles. I remember a time when that was not normal at all. And in fact, it seemed weird for a number of years when kids were being forced to put their helmets on, and now it's been normalized. So behavior changes. Things change in our society. Gender and race relations have changed, improved dramatically in the last 20 years. Attitudes towards homosexuality and a host of things formerly seen as very difficult to change have progressed very rapidly. Gay marriage went from being a, a very complex, not complex, but very contentious uh, political issue 10 years ago to now people are running from opposition to it. In, in five or 10 years, it'll be seen as the same kind, it'll be seen as a backwater, just like we see uh, racial designation laws, like the, the previous prohibitions of whites marrying blacks and so forth. It'll be seen as absurd, the position that was taken by politicians the last 10 years. So things can change. Even things seen as so central and important change in our society. So I'd like to advance an argument that we may be reaching the end of medicine. And I mean this in two senses. First, for basic reasons of biology, we have an intrinsic mortality. There must be limits to what medicine can do for us, at least in terms of our longevity. So with respect to the olshansky austin wager, I side with Olshansky, at least for the next century. We can't live much longer than we are. Second, the second reason I think we're reaching the end of medicine it has to do with the fact that since socioeconomic status advancement seems to explain most of the health improvement we've seen in the last century and most of the persistent problems, I think we are approaching, indeed I think we already have reached, the limits of what medical care can do for us, the limits of what medical care can do to advance the health of the public. Since social and population factors, and not medical ones, are so important in explaining both why longevity has improved and why there are problems still. The point is that medicine may have done most of what it can do for us. We may have already extracted all the value from the last century of medical discoveries. Hence, I do not think that it is to medicine and biological science that we should primarily turn so as to cure our ills. I think it is to public health and to social science. Now, we, we, need, to think, we need to think more expansively about the real causes of illness in our society. Healthcare can deal with disease and illness, but a lack of healthcare is not the cause of disease and illness. To quote social epidemiologist Ichiro Kawachi, it is like saying that since an aspirin cures a fever, the lack of aspirin must be the cause of the fever. But that's not the case. The cause of the fever in our society is not the lack of healthcare. It is, as we have seen, much more. And I say this with the deepest appreciation for the strengths and value of medical care. And I say it as someone who also knows it to be effective much of the time. My own biography should be ample proof of my fealty to medicine. I grew up in a household where serious illness was afoot since the time I was a boy. I was a child, as you know, of a chronically and seriously ill parent. I spent my youth fascinated by the workings of medicine both personally and abstractly. And I spent years caring for seriously ill patients. And I've seen life-saving drugs and procedures close up. And I've had the privilege even of saving people's lives myself or of helping families to cope with serious illness, which is an extraordinary privilege that I've had. And even so, I come to the point of view that I'm sharing with you today. And in fact, this is one of the deepest conflicts that I feel. I'm intimately familiar with the life-saving power of medicine. So I wrestle with this a lot. <laughs>
And I want to tell you a story that one of my colleagues told me about how he saved a man with a bullet in his heart. Now, years ago, and still to this day, it was customary for uh, surgeons. After you finish medical school, you might do a surgical residency. And, uh, and those residencies are often quite long, five, six, seven years. And towards the end of that time, you are often appointed as a chief resident. And the chief resident is like the most senior surgical resident. And in many hospitals then, and many still to this day, the chief surgical resident would move into the hospital for a three-month period during their, surgical, their chief residency year. And they would live in an apartment right next to the emergency room so they could be instantly available in the time of an emergency. They wouldn't leave. They would have conjugal visits. Their spouse would come visit them. Their laundry would be done. They would eat in the hospital food for three months. That was where they would be in order to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three months to provide instantaneous care to patients. And this friend of mine told me a story about a patient of his that he saw in what we used to call him uh, in, during my residency, uh, Knife and Gun Club, which is Saturday night in big cities. Uh, and you would often have people that were brought in uh, knifed uh, or stabbed. And one day he was called immediately as a patient was rushed in and arrived in seconds. So he gets a call, he's in the little suite, it's two in the morning or something, you know, patient isn't coming in, jumps out of bed, and he runs you know, from here to there and is inside the trauma bay uh, in the emergency room as the patient is being swept in uh, with an injury, with a gun injury. And this patient, in fact, and he was there within seconds, and this patient, in fact, had been shot in the heart. Now the patient had an entry wound, so when the patient was being stripped, literally there were people jumping up onto the cart, cutting the patient's clothes off, preparing the patient. And so by the time he arrived in the trauma bay, the patient had been stripped and you could see the bullet hole in his chest. And then you, of course, you feel around and you actually have to feel around most of the body because bullets, when they go in, you can ricochet and come out. They don't just go like in the movies, uh, you know, in here and out there. They bounce around in the body, but they searched the patient's body and they didn't see an exit wound. So it meant the bullet was still uh, in the patient. And unfortunately, the patient uh, was dead uh, in the trauma bay. He had what is known as asystole. He had no heartbeat and uh, no pulse. Nevertheless, this surgeon friend of mine decided to prep the patient anyway and started to crack his chest with a saw. So you put a scalpel down the sternum, and then you reach the sternum, and then you use a, a little rotary saw, and you cut it like you would cut like some wood. It's like a surgical rotary saw. And then you put in these big clamps, and you open it up like you might crack a lobster shell and like open up the patient's chest. And he did all of this to the patient, the dead patient, uh, while he was there, uh, while he was on the trauma bay. And I asked him, I said, you did this without anesthesia? And he said, yes, the patient was dead. And he put his gloved hands into the patient and he felt the bullet hole in the patient's heart, in the patient's right ventricle. Now, if you're gonna be shot in the heart, actually the best place you can be shot is in the right ventricle. <laughs> Left ventricle is not as good. <laughs> but the right ventricle, you can survive uh, a right ventricular uh, puncture uh, with a bullet. And, uh, and he put his gloved finger through the hole in the heart and rubbed his finger around, and he felt the bullet sloshing around in the blood of the heart that wasn't beating. And only then did the anesthesiologist start administering anesthesia to this patient. And my friend fished the bullet out with his fingers and began to check for lacerations in the coronary arteries, the arteries that supply the, blood itse the heart itself with blood uh, supply, which to make sure they weren't cut, which would have been a more serious injury. And he began, and then they started cardiopulmonary bypass on the patient. They took the patient and put him on a machine that was pumping uh, blood through his body. And they did a more thorough procedure on the patient. Now, relaxing a little bit, opening him up, exploring the wound, trying to look at what damage had been done inside the heart, seeing that there was no any damage to the rear of the heart by reaching around behind it in, in the pericardial sac, and so forth. So they completed the procedure, and the patient lived. And many years later, he was still coming to this doctor's clinic, a follow-up clinic that this doctor had. And I asked my friend, I asked him, how did that make you feel to have operated on a patient so dead that you could crack his chest open with a saw without anesthesia, and then to have saved his life, and to have brought him back literally from death. And my friend said to me, it made me feel like a god. It's unbelievable what modern medicine can do, isn't it? So how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile a story like that with everything that I've been telling you in this class? It's very difficult to be aware of that and still 
believe as I do that medical care is not the primary driver of health in our society. And I too have had personal experiences similar to this, although nowhere near as dramatic, on a much smaller scale. I've had the moral and personal and clinical satisfaction of caring for countless people when they were dying. I've seen powerful drugs work. I've seen them ease psychosis, ease pain, cure infections, cure the heart. And I struggle with this so much, coping with this part of my identity, this face-to-face -face confrontation of what modern medicine can do, which is astonishing, and the realization of everything else that I've been teaching you and talking to you about for the last few months. I can't escape this tension, actually. Many years ago, I was doing some other research I, for one of my first books on the role of prognosis in medicine. And I had the occasion to read some case notes by a very famous physician at Johns Hopkins by the name of William Osler, who was writing at the turn of the last century. And as part of a paper he published on the prognostic course of pneumonia, technical topic, he's writing about how can doctors predict what happens with pneumonia. I encountered the case that he described of a young 23-year-old mother who was dying of bacterial pneumonia. And it had all this rich clinical detail describing this young woman who was dying and the, her inexorable course to death. And I found myself with tears in my eyes reading this arcane piece of medical history at that point. Because I, because I saw that if that woman had been my patient today, I could walk into her hospital room, lift my pinky, and save her life like that. In the last hundred years, due to the inventions and discoveries that modern science has given us. And I could do so much that I could offer her. And very, very few young people die this way anymore, at least in our country, from bacterial pneumonia. In fact, when I went to medical school, I had wanted to be a reconstructive surgeon to attach uh, severed limbs was my desire then. And I, uh, for a variety of reasons, I got connected with a very kind, very famous surgeon in my first year of medical school. And he took me under his wing. And I would skip class and go operate with him for most of my first year of medical school. And I saw him up close doing unbelievable things. For reasons I can't still fully understand, I was first assisting on these cases. I don't know where the residents or the, or the uh, fellows were. But it was him operating and me standing right next to him. <laughs> your age, <laughs> and, uh, and he was doing incredible things. People who had attempted suicide by shooting themselves in the head and had failed and who had blown apart their faces, he was repairing them. Or people who were born with craniofacial abnormalities with something known as orbital hypertelierism, where the eye sockets don't come fully forward together so they're on either side of the brain. He would do a sagittal incision on the patient, like cut behind the hairline, peel the face down, cut the bones from the middle of the orbits and swing the orbits together and wire them closer together without putting undue traction on the optic nerve and reshape the patient's face. And I watched him do it right, right in front of my eyes. And I found myself stunned with what I was seeing because it was incredible. Nevertheless, over the course of that year of skipping class and operating with the surgeon, I still became disillusioned. Because we were, it seemed to me, simply putting our holes in dikes, our, holes, uh, our fingers in holes in dikes. And between the two of us, we had only 20 fingers. And the patients with horrible problems, patients born without jaws, shot in the face, cut to bits, never stopped coming. And I found myself wanting to build better dikes rather than plug holes in existing ones, a realization I came to early in my medical training. So despite these incredible things that I've witnessed and, to a lesser extent, participated in, these antibiotics, the surgery, and so on, I have still come to believe that medical interventions are increasingly cosmetic when it comes to enhancing the health of the populace. Indeed, I believe they may even distract us from the true nature of the problem. And they may distract us from more convivial, more effective, and in fact, perhaps more moral solutions to these problems. After all, why was that man shot in the heart to begin with? I mean, why did he require all this care? What were the reasons that he came to the hospital and needed this amazing treatment? Why are 2% of deaths in the United States due to firearms? Why are 2% due to medical error? Why are 6% due to poverty? And why are 20% of deaths in the United States due to tobacco? I am not saying that we should ditch medicine, just that we should show, know its limits and its utility. 
And we should properly frame its position in our society and properly frame its role in advancing the health of the public. Now, this disposition that I'm arguing for, that we should adopt with respect to modern medicine, fits in more broadly with, uh, with what I regard to be good qualities in the way one should lead one, leads one <laughs> fits in, this disposition fits in with broader dispositions that I think all of us should bring to our lives more generally. So it's not just a kind of policy posture that I'm advocating for. It's a kind of personal way of life that I'm advocating for. A way of life that encourages humility and breadth of thought. That doesn't think that this is the cure to the problem. And doesn't think it's a narrow cure. That it's open to different ways that we might see problems. And recognizes the limitations in what human beings can do to confront serious problems. Things are rarely as simple as they seem. And in fact, it's arrogant to think that they are or that we can fix human suffering with any one approach. And in fact, it's a kind of hubris as well. So given how intimately connected health is to the social and natural state of human affairs, it is hard not to take such issues seriously. And I want to close with a kind of leaving you with the following set of ideas. What are we as a society to do about illness and suffering in our midst? To what extent and how must we respond to the sources and consequences of this state of affairs? What kind of civilization do we want? Do we want one that takes care of people who are ill? Do we want one that recognizes the play of the natural and social lottery? Do we want one that actually is deeply invested in what is, for most people, one of the most fundamental aspects of their existence, whether or not they suffer and whether and when they die? Do we not need a public health response as part of this civilization we ideally would like to build for ourselves? Because as far as I'm concerned, there are moral issues at stake here. Issues of what kind of life we want to lead and what kind of opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness we want everyone in our society to have. Thank you. Year, I'll be right across the street here as well as up the street here. I have an open door policy, so if you have anything that I can help you with, let me know. Goodbye. <laughs>